let me start by saying that a lot of what you just heard from Dr. O'Donnell is very relevant to what I want to share with you. Um, be yourself. Big important message. Um, but another important message is figuring out who you are, because that's the only way you can be yourself, right? So I want to talk with you today about um, some thoughts I have and also um, engage you, I hope, in a brief discussion. We don't have a lot of time. We can talk more about some of these issues tomorrow, but I want to um, see if we can have a, a bit of a discussion. Briefly, I want to, um, this is very slow. Discuss with you again some of the kinds of health contributions that you hope to make um, and with whom, for whom. Think a little bit about the kinds of employment, the kinds of jobs that you might want to become involved in, and what those responsibilities would entail. And then, how to go about it, short term and long term, how to achieve some of these um, goals that you might have. And of course, we have lots of time to do this right now. I'm going to try to do this really in the next uh, 20 minutes. But first, a show of hands. I'm serious now. How many of you here want to have a job when you finish? Well, that's good, okay. I'm glad to see that most of you want to become gainfully employed. Um, <clears throat> how many of you have already started thinking about this? Oh, so not quite as many. Okay, it looks, looks about this. All right, that's good. All right, then we can have a discussion. But what I'm thinking about these issues, here's some of the big questions that I think you're going to want to consider. Whose well-being do you want to help improve? These are the sort of big questions, right? Who do you want to work with? Who do you want to help? Who do you want to be engaged with? What others do you want to contribute to? Um, in terms of the actual job, who do you want to work for? There are lots of different ways to make a living while you're contributing to other people's well-being. And depending on who you are working for, who's, who's paying your bills, uh, you could have a very rewarding or a very uh, difficult life. What are the kinds of health problems you're interested in? And these are, these are partly related to each other, as I think you might imagine. A little bit more specific, and again, related to these issues, what subject areas do you want to work in? And I, I'm talking here, well, I'll, I'll explain this in a minute, but I'm talking almost in terms of the academic subjects that, that you think of, but also the kinds of uh, subject areas, health problems. And in order to do all this, what skill sets do you have to bring to the table, or do you need to get in order to do any of the uh, things that we just mentioned here. So how do you bring it all together? First of all, let's just briefly go over some of the kinds of organizations and their functions. We're all aware that there are funders. So you could imagine a job in which your responsibility was helping to spread money, money to do good things. Um, and here are some examples that Again, we're all familiar with. Some of, have, have any of you thought about that as something you'd like to do as a career? Who among you might be interested in working for, working for, not getting money from, working for the World Bank or the Gates Foundation? Any of you? Some of you, okay, that's good. So that's a possibility. It's a very different kind of job, of course, than the kinds of organizations that implement, that actually do things, that coordinate the actual work, provide technical assistance and so forth. And here's a, a short list and there are many others as you know. 
my guess is many of you have thought about doing this as a career. Yes? Yeah? Okay. So one thing that this immediately brings to mind, and I don't know that I brought it out explicitly though, is short term, long term. So you might think about the short term. Well, in the short term, um, I'd like to work with an implementer position. But maybe in the long term, I really want to work for Gates and make sure that they spend their money wisely uh, in helping people in need. How many of you think you'd like to do research for a career? Quite a few of you. And, and had, I, had I read your presentations beforehand, I might have organized this a little bit differently. But I was really pleased to see that quite a few of you uh, would consider some form of research as a job, uh, as a career. Um, and of course, mostly universities or sometimes private think tanks, uh, private companies will ask you to do research um, as, a, as a job. Other kinds of organizations involve governance. So there are various governmental agencies or non-governmental, multi-governmental uh, organizations that work around health systems. They don't do the research, but they take the research and they uh, help to make it implemented. Um, they organize funding with implementers. They help see that the research that needs to be done is funded, but also what the implementers need to be done, need to, need to uh, do rather, has the knowledge base to make that happen. Advocacy. I don't know if any of you have thought about this as a career, again, short or long term, but working to raise the awareness and support for global health issues is actually something that you could do for a living. And a number of you talked with passion already today about advocacy, about advocating for um, opposition to inequality, advocating for the poor, advocating for certain various, various uh, groups that might need uh, your concern. You might even be interested in product development. More and more we're finding products being developed and tools and, and uh, devices that are directed at the specific needs of the poor in developing countries, in low and middle income countries. And so this is another possibility that you might think about. And I hate to say that if all else fails, but sometimes that's what happens. If all else fails, you might end up being a consultant. But I want to put that in a positive light. You might actually want to be a consultant. It gives you a certain amount of independence. It also allows you flexibility. Um, and again, you don't have to think about this in the uh, short term, or in the long term, rather, it can be in the short term. Um, and so it's another possibility. So these are all examples of organizations and, and what they do that you might think about. The reality is that most of the organizations do a lot of one of those things and a little of some or many of the other things. And so most organizations don't just um, do research, they also uh, promote ideas, they advocate. Um, they sometimes, sometimes can generate their own internal funding. They often collaborate with um, NGOs or governmental organizations. So if, you, if you're thinking about, well, gee, that's really what I'd like to do, but I'd also like to do this and maybe a little of that, it might be possible to find a position that does that. So again, back to something that Dr. O'Donnell said, you really have to be yourself, identify your passion, and use that as a, as a, um, as a driving force behind your, your, your goal seeking, behind your searching. So among the areas of interest, 
diseases. We've talked a lot about them today, and some of them could be uh, general communicable diseases, uh, or as we know, non-communicable diseases, which is what we talked about most today. Um, and so you can use these disease areas or special areas involving groups of people as a way to uh, help you identify the kind of job that you're looking for. But you have to have a passion for it. You have to really be, be driven and want to be able to uh, contribute through those disease areas. But another way you could think about the kind of job you'd like to have, you'd eventually want to pursue, could be what are the exposures that you're interested in? And I think most of you understand what, I'm, what I mean by this. Um, you're especially interested in uh, reducing flood-related ill health conditions, or you're, you're passionate about reducing smoking uh, and, and smoking related cancers, for example. So you can think about combining these in, in different ways such that your passion for these problems is being um, considered. You might also want to think about the kinds of population groups who you really feel strongly about, who you care about, who you're uh, your deep feelings uh, lie with. Sometimes you can identify them personally, identify with them personally because of personal experiences or whatever, but think about that and let that be part of your, your processing of what you'd like to do and how you'd like to achieve it. Um, there are a whole slew of different kinds of issues and we've touched on a few of them today. Um, the fact that most of you were doing work on cancer-related problems doesn't mean that you have to have a job that does that. A lot of the skills that you learned or a lot of the areas that you're, you become, population groups you become interested in, have a lot of other issues, in quotes here, that um, you might find appealing, that you might uh, really be turned on by. There's a whole slew of disciplines, too. Um, so one of the things that I'm recommending is that you think seriously about the skills that you have um, and how those disciplines have provided you with those skills. Have a basic understanding of a broad range of them, but be really good at a few of them. And here's a, a kind of short list, um, on the top of which, of course, is epidemiology. Um, but you might also have skills around developing health policy. Some of you may have taken courses in that area. Some of you may want to um, do more on your own around health policy. Or you might find discipline and skill uh, needs around health systems or possibly around health economics. A number of the uh, topics that were discussed today involve is this the best way to do it? Is the most cost effective? Is there a cost benefit to uh, that intervention versus this one? Having skills that allow you to at least be articulate around those issues, if not be able to use those skills, really can be um, attractive to people who are looking, looking to fill slots. Maybe you're interested in, in human rights, uh, possibly uh, applying social and behavioral sciences. Um, you might also want to use your biological sciences. A few of you were talking about your basic backgrounds in biological sciences. Um, perhaps you're interested in management. This is something that uh, we don't often think about and many of you may not have had coursework in, but being able to plan and execute uh, projects is a, is a skill that oftentimes is being looked for. You might want to be active in environmental and occupational health. Um, or even have basic skills in demography. Being able to analyze patterns uh, rigorously um, is, is a critical skill set that a lot of agencies, a lot of uh, organizations are looking for. And then finally, uh, again on this short list, ethics. How many of you care about ethics? Only half of you? No, you're just tired. <laughs> All of you do. But in fact, Caring about things isn't equivalent to being having a basic understanding and eventually maybe even having a skill set 
around any of these areas. So, so the idea here is think about what you really care about, want to learn more about, are able to um, uh, invest time in because you think it will help you achieve your uh, job searching goals. What are those options? And I said I was going to do this quickly and I am racing through this, but I'm just I'm going to try to sort of toss out some ideas here for you. Well, what are your skills and interests? Um, I don't want to say that there's a, a possible job out there for any and every one of you depending on your skills and interests and if, if it's not there you might be able to create it. But actually I think that's almost true. Academia is <clears throat> the obvious one. Um, and certainly some form or another of a research assistant position is possible, but it may not be long term um, with an MPH. Uh, some of you have already started to produce, uh, pursue uh, advanced training at, at the doctoral level. Um, and my sense is that um, becoming a faculty member or a research scientist at an academic institution is something that will require a PhD. It's a huge commitment, just like the one that you'd make if you were becoming a, um, an MD. Um, but academia is sort of the obvious uh, domain where you might look for a job. Tons of non-academic positions, though. And, and I, I didn't mention this, but no, you don't have to be like us. We're all, we're all getting old, and so some of these positions are opening up, but not nearly enough, believe me. Um, Non-academic positions. Again, what you want to do is think of yourself as an expert in some area. And when you go to that job opening, that job opportunity, a lot of what was said in the previous presentation applies here as well. You want to go in knowing what you know, being uh, clear and straightforward about your abilities and skills, where you're an expert, uh, and what, what you can uh, solve in the way of problems, uh, or, um, or, or, or both, and do it in a way that, that shows confidence, but also recognizing your own shortcomings. And again, this is sort of reflecting on yourself and being yourself. Um, one challenge, though, is that very often to get that first job, you have to have experience. And I think you all have faced this uh, in job searches, in, uh, in searching for internships and other positions, is that the chicken and egg problem. You need experience to get the job, and you need the job to get the experience. And so don't let that discourage you, but at the same time recognize sometimes that's a limitation. How do you get around that? The V word, volunteer. Um, I think most of you know that very well. Um, I see heads nodding and eyes rolling, probably. <laughs> um, but don't be afraid to do that. Um, a lot of people are afraid of the private sector. And this, this includes a lot of different kinds of jobs and types of, uh, of institutions or organizations. I would discourage you from shying away uh, because you're selling out, some of your colleagues might say. I actually think that there are many opportunities that you should and could uh, investigate and consider seriously, keeping in mind that it doesn't have to be your life that you're going to spend with this, um, with this uh, capitalist ripoff company that's just destroying the world, and making a lot of money in the process too. No, I think actually you can, you can think about that as, as, a, as a, even a short-term option, um, especially if the ideal job hasn't come about yet. And then again, this notion of being an independent consultant, um, by choice of necessity sometimes, um, it's, it's not um, demeaning necessarily to only have a job like that. It, it really depends on, on you and how you feel about yourself and what you'd like to accomplish in the short term. Requires a lot of self-motivation, but this notion of independence also um, 
if you don't intend to do this for a long term but you don't have a job, you can find a way then to make it look nicer on your CV uh, by being an independent uh, consultant. And then the other thing that, that this also is, is uh, it re requires and also creates more of are opportunities for networking. And networking is really critical. Um, so some of the things that yeah, some of the things that you should think about, consider when when you're thinking about these different kinds of jobs is what's the what's the position's organizational focus, the organization's focus. In other words, is it around the diseases that you're interested in, or possibly the exposures that you care about, uh, certain groups, certain disciplinary areas or special areas. Most organizations will have a mixture of this, but some will focus very heavily on one or the other. Think about what you're really excited about, um, and don't just apply to a job because it's the only thing that you can find out there. The functional areas, again, we talked about these. Think about what's, what's this position really going to um, address? Which of these areas um, will, will I be involved in if I, if I take a job like this? Depending on the type of uh, position, it, you'll either be doing it at a, at a multinational, global level, or it could actually be at a very local, uh, local level with a, a small um, private sector uh, company, for example. And then the geographic location where your work takes place doesn't necessarily even have to be at the same location where the people who you're hoping to help actually live. So you can be involved in activities that um, include work here in the United States uh, and yet be helping people in other countries that you care about. So lots of trade-offs and considerations and I don't think I'm surprising anybody with this sort of quick summary, but I did want to present it in a way that gets you thinking about it and talking about it, sharing um, with each other some quick select, uh, suggestions that you might consider, which I found helped me and I think a lot of the uh, people who I work with and, and students who I talk to think backwards, plan backwards. In other words, so, how many of you have thought about what you'd like to be doing, what kind of a position you'd like to have 20 years from now? Great, most of you have. I highly recommend, well, even 10 years from now, even five years from now. But think backwards in the sense of, I'd like, out, like to be here and doing this and, and earning that and helping these people and so forth 10, 15, 20 years from now. What do I need to do now? What would I like to do now? that will probably take me down that road. And it's really hard to do because um, sometimes those roads that aren't taken and you know, you know about all that. But try to do it in an active way. I think it'll, it'll help you. Networking I mentioned, it's really critical. I think I personally have always underestimated this. I'm not a good networker. But I really am increasingly convinced now that this is very important. Um, and again, it's related to what you have or don't have on Facebook or, or on LinkedIn or you name it. Um, really critical to uh, meet people, talk about your work, share your ideas, um, put yourself out there, but in a way that's genuine, be yourself. Consider your goals. In other words, what do you really want to do? You want to help other people. We, none of us do this to get rich, right? But um, at the same time, you still have to pay the bills. And so think about uh, your goals in the context of the larger issues, including further training. You don't necessarily have to earn a PhD in order to get a meaningful and well-paying job. Um, weigh your priorities. Uh, balance your life with your career. Many of us got involved in the work that we do because we were passionate about it, but I can tell you that 
there are many times when I also think about how much time I spend doing my work and how much time therefore I don't spend doing other things that are part of life. Um, and, and very often my wife rightly um, accuses me of letting my work take over my life, become my life. Be mindful of that as, as, as we move forward and yet at the same time be passionate about what you want to do. Um, this notion of uh, the work-life work balance or, or, or career-life balance also suggests that you ought to rely on friends and family to help you think that through. Don't be afraid to um, explore that with others. Okay, that's really all I wanted to say, but I'd like to just spend, if we have two or three more minutes, and see if you guys have questions or thoughts or ideas re reflecting on what I just said that, that you want to share. Please. Thank you. Yes? Is it true <laughs> that academia is the only position that you can get to give you a good work life balance while still having independency? No. Okay. Should I say more? Yes. Okay. <laughs> no, I don't think so. Um, I mean, in, in a funny way, if you have a high powered, um, non academic, especially for profit company based position, where you're expected to perform, not only do you not have flexibility, like we do for the most part in academia, but you are under pressure. Why? Because you can be fired. And so I actually think that we in academia have it pretty darn good. I can't believe that they pay me to do something that I do reasonably well, maybe, and feel good about, but I really, I'm excited. I mean, I'm, I'm passionate about what I, what I do because I think it means something. Because hopefully the students who take my classes learn something. Because they're they're going to um, go out and do good things in the world. So I'm multiplying my my concerns. And they pay me to do that, and I can be flexible. Um, I don't have the summer off, but I can come to meet with you guys because I, I have flexibility in my schedule. I mean, there's a lot of benefits to academia. And yet, we also have pressures to produce grants, to publish, uh, to get outstanding uh, reviews from our students. And so, I, I mean, any job that you take seriously and for which you are expected to perform, you're going to have to balance your own desire to do well the expectations that you must do well if you're to be considered a valuable contributor, etc., against balance, I guess, against your own interest in interacting with people in a friendly manner, your desire to go see movies, your, uh, your desire to be with your family, for example. All those are balance issues, right? It just seems like a bit of a, a dream, or a, I don't know, and I'm sure it's, it's, it is a, right, it's a reality for some of you in this room, but how do you, how do you make it to reality? Like, if you do go down the um, academia path, or is there another path similar to academia that gives you that balance where you can go see a movie, um, but still feel like you're, um, you're doing work that you're passionate about and you don't feel sucked into this kind of doing something for someone else kind of ordeal? I mean, I'll, I'll maybe ask my colleagues to help me here, but one, one sense I have is that there are um, <clears throat> positions working with, um, say, government agencies or, uh, or NGOs or, um, or other kinds of research entities in which the you do punch a clock in, in a sense. In other words, the expectations outside of the nine to five are much more reduced. And you aren't expected to do, to, to work a, a 60, 70, 80 hour week. And, and in some ways, those can be just as meaningful, but the flip side of that is, not only are you not expected to, but you might not be able to do more 
then what, what that position uh, is set up for you to do. Um, and some people prefer it that way and it makes the balance act a lot easier. Um, but on the other hand, if you're not there to punch the clock at nine o'clock, then there's a problem. So it's, you know, with, with the flexibility of academia um, comes the responsibility to, to work 60 and 80 hour weeks. So it's difficult. Other, other thoughts or questions? Yeah. So, so in thinking about getting a job in academia in the future, when applying to PhD programs, is there something that one should look for in that PhD program to prepare you for that kind of job? Um, again, go back to what you think you'd like to do. Work backwards towards skills. Skills, I think, is really important. If you have skills that you can market, that you can go to an employer and say, here's what I can do for you, you're in so much better position than to, to go in and say, well, I really care about this, or this work is, is important to me and I will work hard and, and do a good job for you. Everybody can say that, and everybody should say that because that's almost always the truth. If it's, if it's not the truth, then you shouldn't be applying to that job. But if you can go in and say, and, here is how I'll go about it. Here's the, here are the skills that I can bring to that position. Here's the, um, the and the skills don't have to be technical skills. They can be um, ways of, they can involve creativity or innovation. They could um, uh, be persons, uh, people skills. You could, you could bring, bring groups of people together and, and make them uh, more productive. You could, um, be good at, at uh, organizing people in the field, for example. You don't have to be, um, I know how to use SAS and, and, and you know, write this code or, um, or other skills like that. But more, the more skills you can bring, the better. And you want to go to a program that teaches skills and that also has, um, again, back to what Dr. O'Donnell was just talking about, also has the kind of ambiance, the atmosphere that you personally feel you seek. Some people want a highly competitive uh, atmosphere and really want people uh, who, who are going to uh, be, be challenging them all the time um, and or possibly ignoring them because they're off in their own corner doing their own thing and they don't want to don't want to hear, hear about you. Other, other programs will have a much more collaborative atmosphere and, and way of functioning. So think about that as well. I guess the other thing is you can't deny geography and you certainly can't deny the strengths of some programs in some areas versus other programs in different areas. I mean, there, you know, there are the U.S. News and World Report rankings, but those don't mean anything if what you really want to learn and do and become is really the best at this one place, even though their overall ranking might be very low. So think about that as well. And, and then I guess one final thing, you're in a PhD program, you're likely to be working with a very small number of faculty members, and you're likely to have one who will be your primary faculty member. And depending on how the program's organized, make sure that at least one or two of the people who are on that faculty are ones who you really feel you'd want to work with. Let me, let's, yeah, let's get some feedback here from our, our colleagues. I recommend to people that you select a job that's your, your first job in particular that's easy to leave. <laughs> and that may, that's because you've learned things in that job the organization is well known and has a great reputation and that there are senior people there who can mentor you and write you letters of recommendation and those mentors will have a national network that will help you throughout your career so I, I think if you have a choice um, select the job that is easiest to leave. 
because you're likely to have four or five jobs during your career, maybe more. And you're going to be doing different things in each of those positions. Um, I started as a sociologist. Um, I would not have predicted at the time I got my PhD that I'd be doing work related to medicine at all. Um, so things happen, circumstances in the environment change and so forth to offer you opportunities that you may not know about now. But if you've been working in great organizations and that you've had good mentorship and developed some skills that you can market, like Mark says, you're going to be uh, better off. And sometimes the easiest places to leave are in the geographically uh, most undesirable locations <laughs> and pay nothing. But if you see it as an opportunity to launch your career because of the people who are there, the reputation of the organizations, um, you know, do it. Because it's not going to be forever. We can talk more. I think Mark yeah. mentioned so many interesting points here that we can elaborate on as we go.